Hello everyone, in today's video we are going to look at the thermal definition of entropy. Now this was the way entropy was initially defined and discovered by the physicist Clausius. And in the next video we are going to look at the statistical mechanics definition of entropy. That's entropy in terms of macrostates and microstates, which a lot of people think is arguably a more fundamental definition of entropy. But we'll also show that those two definitions are entirely equivalent. And so it's really useful to see both of these ways of describing entropy, because both of them shine a different light on exactly what entropy is. And it's not really the case that one of them is more or less fundamental than the other. They are both very interesting ways of looking at what the concept of entropy actually is. So in order to, uh, to discuss the thermal definition of entropy, we first have to recap uh, what is meant by a reversible process and an irreversible process in thermal physics. Now, in nature, there are a ton of processes which we would describe as irreversible. And what that means is that we can start with, with some system, we run the process, but then there's no way we can easily run that process in reverse to leave the system in exactly the same way it started off as. So if I am holding an egg, for example, and I throw that egg against a wall, that egg will scramble. And then there's no real easy way for me to reverse that process and end up again with a whole perfectly formed egg. That's what's known as an irreversible process. But there are also processes in the, um, there are also processes out there which are reversible. And what that means is if we start off with some, uh, some system and we run some process, it is then easy for us to reverse that process and end up with the system in exactly the same state that we started with. So um, we talked previously about heat engines. So we can think of this as, say we had an engine and we put a load of heat into it and then that engine uses that heat to do work and to drive a wheel, to make a wheel spin. Well, we might be able to set up our engine such that we can then spin the wheel ourselves manually, put work ourselves into the system, and then us spinning that wheel manually can generate heat within the engine. And we might be able to set it up so that we can put in the same amount of work um, that we got out in the first place and end up with the system in exactly the same state that it started with. So that's what's called a reversible process. Now, in the last video, we looked at Clausius' theorem, and this is what led Clausius to define the notion of entropy. So to recap, Clausius' theorem said that for a reversible process, if we go through a whole cycle of this, so if we run the process, then run the reverse of it, so we end up where we started with, then this quantity here, if we integrate the um, 1 over t with respect to the heat, dq over t, um, then we, that is always equal to zero over a closed cycle. So once we've run the process and run it in reverse, this, this here, the integral of dq over t is equal to zero. And then Clausius generalized this and said that in general, if we're not just looking at a reversible process, but we also allow irreversible processes, then the integral around a closed loop is equal to dq over t. Um, sorry, the integral around a closed loop of dq over t is less than or equal to zero. So it equals zero for a reversible process, and it's less than zero for an irreversible process. And this is something really fundamental. This equation describes every single system in the universe. So Clausius um, was then motivated to define entropy like this. Now, entropy is a function of state. And what Clausius has said is that the change in entropy, so change is normally written as a delta, and S is the letter that represents entropy. So the change in entropy between two points, so if I say the entropy at um, some state of affairs of our system B minus the entropy at some state of affairs of our system A, so this is the change in entropy between our two systems at two different states, that is equal to the integral from A to B of dq rev over t. So apologies for my sloppy handwriting, but what Clausius has said is that let's define this notion of entropy, and we won't say like what the absolute entropy is, but it only makes sense to talk um, about changes in entropy. So if we start with our system at some state of affairs A, so a certain pressure, a certain volume, a certain temperature, whatever it may be, and then we do something to get it to state B, a different pressure, volume, temperature, whatever, then the change in entropy is equal to, if we imagine that we got from A to B in a reversible way, this integral here between A and B of dq rev over t. And 
This is how Clausius defined entropy, and at this stage, it's not really anything more than a definition. We've defined this function of state, and we've said that it's the integral between the two states of affairs of dq over t for a reversible process between those two states of affairs. But what we're going to see next is that this definition actually um, can reframe the second law of thermodynamics in what seems like a much more fundamental way. And though even though this um, concept of entropy, as we've defined it here, seems fairly arbitrary, there's no sort of immediate uh, thing in our physical world which we can say, oh, dq over t, of course. You know, we don't have anything which we can immediately grasp hold of conceptually for that. But actually, once we start reframing things in terms of this s, the second law of thermodynamics becomes much more simple. And actually, it seems much, much more fundamental. So let's have a look at that now. So let me draw your attention to this diagram over here. Now here I have on the y-axis pressure and on the x-axis volume, and this is what's known as PV parameter space. But really what we're saying here is that imagine we have our system and our system starts off at point A. Now our system could be a box of gas molecules, it could be whatever we want really, but it starts off at point A and at point A it's at a certain pressure and it's at a certain volume. And then what we're going to do is we are going to do some change to our system. And by means of this change, we are going to bring it to some pressure and volume as at point B. So we are changing the system some way. And we are going to do it along this path here. And what this means is this is an irreversible process. So whatever we're doing to get it from A to B, we're doing it in an irreversible way. So we can't easily reverse that process um, with putting the same amount of heat in that we got out, for example, to end up back at A via that route. So we go from A to B via an irreversible process, but then we take our system from the pressure and volume at point B back to the pressure and volume at point A, but this time we do it in a purely reversible way. So we're going from A to B in an irreversible way, but then we're changing how we're operating and we're going from B to A in a reversible way. And what we're going to do now is we are going to use Clausius' theorem up here and we are going to apply it to, to this closed loop here, going from A to B and then back again. We have a closed loop, so we can apply Clausius' theorem to it, and let's see what we get. Well, we start off going from A to B, um, and we have dq over t, and notice that this is an irreversible process going from A to B, so I'm not writing dq rev, it's an irreversible process going from A to B, so we just say dq over t, and then we add to that the portion where we're going from B to A, but this time we're doing, doing it in a reversible manner. So here I can say dq rev over t, and this whole thing is less than or equal to zero because we've gone around a closed loop. So um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this to the other side. So I'm going to say the integral from A to B of dq over t, is less than or equal to minus the integral from b to a of dq rev over t. And now I am going to uh, flip this integral around. So I'm going to say, instead of going from b to a, why don't we go from a to b? And I can do this because this is a reversible process. So if I had to put a certain amount of heat in to do this process from b to a, then I can take that heat out in going from A to B. And so all we have when we reverse this integral is a factor of minus one. And again, we can do this because this portion of the cycle is reversible. That's the key point here. So now we have the integral from A to B of dq over t, this side remains the same, is less than or equal to the integral from A to B of dq rev, over t. But remember that we defined the change in entropy as exactly this. The change in entropy from state of affairs um, A to state of affairs B is the integral over a reversible cycle of this quantity here. So this is actually equal to delta s. So we have delta s, the change in entropy, is, um, is greater than or equal to the integral from A to B 
of dq over t. And now I'm going to make one more, uh, one more point. Let's imagine that our system, whatever it is, is thermally isolated. Now thermally isolated essentially means the system is closed off. There's no way of getting heat out of the system and there's no way of putting heat into the system. That system is sealed off to us. So for a thermally isolated system, because there can be no change in heat either into or out of the system, we have dq, the change in heat, is equal to zero. So this whole side is equal to zero. And for a thermally isolated system, the change in entropy, delta, e, delta S, is greater than or equal to zero. And there we have it. This is in fact the second law of thermodynamics, but written in terms of the entropy. And the reason it's the second law of thermodynamics is that Clausius's theorem was derived from the second law of thermodynamics. It takes the second law and it says, well, what does this imply? And what the second law implies is Clausius's theorem. And Clausius's theorem directly implies that delta S is greater than or equal to zero. And you can see why this is such a seductive way of framing the second law, because it is so, so simple. We only have one quantity here, S. And whereas before in the Clausius and Kelvin statements, we had a lot of what seemed like quite waffly language. It's impossible to pass heat from a colder to a hotter for an isolated system without putting work in. That's quite waffly. Now we just have delta S is greater than or equal to zero for a thermally isolated system. And this is a much more fundamental way of framing the second law. And we will see that even more so in the next video when we talk about the statistical mechanics definition of entropy in terms of particles whizzing around and what entropy means in light of that. But to give you an idea of why this is so fundamental, what we can actually do is say, well, the most famous thermally isolated system that there is, I think I'm safe in saying, is the universe itself. Right? The universe itself is not getting heat from outside in. It's not getting work from outside in, and it's not radiating heat out of the universe. Everything is staying within the universe. So, the universe is a thermally isolated system. So we can tentatively apply this to the universe as a whole and make a statement about the universe as a whole. And what I'm going to do very briefly now is reframe the first two laws of thermodynamics in terms of the universe as a whole. So you'll remember the first law of thermodynamics said the change in internal energy of a system, delta U, is equal to the work we put in, delta W, plus the heat we put in, delta Q. Well, like we said, the universe is thermally isolated, so that's equal to zero, that's equal to zero, and we can say the first law of thermodynamics in terms of the entire universe is that the internal energy of the universe, U univ, is equal to some constant. It's not changing. So that's the first law of thermal physics in terms of the universe. And the second law of thermal physics is that the change in entropy of the universe from one state to another over time is always greater than or equal to zero. And now we have made, just through some very basic reasoning, two fundamental statements about the entire universe. And we've done this purely from a classical physics viewpoint, and these hold up, these are like perfectly accurate laws for a thermally isolated system, such as the entire universe. And I think it's so wonderful and beautiful to see such fundamental laws which are so, so simple to define and understand. So that's the thermal definition of entropy. And like I said, it might seem quite arbitrary that we have this quantity, the integral of dq over t, as defining the change in entropy. But we are working with, uh, with physics here, and it's not always going to be the case that the most fundamental concepts are the ones that are most intuitively accessible to us. And entropy certainly seems to be a very fundamental concept. But I think we will get a much more intuitive picture of entropy in the next video, which is when we will look at microstates and macrostates and what entropy means in terms of the way we can arrange all of the particles in our system, because that is a much more intuitive understanding of entropy and arguably a much more fundamental one. So I look forward to going through that with you then. Goodbye.